It's really great to be here. I was here five years ago, I think it was five years ago uh, in the spring. And uh, thank you so much, Kiara, and uh, also Micah. This in no way would have happened without all this work and, and the support of different groups. Uh, I spent uh, half of February in Brazil, and one of the booklets that uh, some people there made, uh, in Portuguese, of course, it, it, on the cover it had a picture of figures going up this slope and then, and then going over the edge of this cliff. And, and the caption was, well, we've come this far, we can't go back now. And, and when I was there, I just held it up and I said, this is, this is, this is the whole deal. There's, you know, this is pretty much it, you know. But, uh, so, by the way, the anarchist thing there is very primitivist, which I had no idea about, but there's a lot of interesting things going on there. Uh, oh, and I wanted to salute the people, uh, if any of them are here, or if they're not here, the people that blocked the, the freeway down there two or three weeks ago, I salute you. And I hope you come out okay on that. Well, I think I'll start. This is a, this is a column I wrote uh, very recently. It was in the Eugene Weekly. I'm from Eugene, Oregon. It's more, it's pretty much just uh, letter to the editor length. I think reading stuff is boring, but I'm just gonna do this as a kind of intro, maybe set the tone a little bit. This is something I think about a lot, this topic. And I also talk about it on my radio show a lot. Some people say too much, but anyway. They called it Terror of Everyday Life. <clears throat> it's headline stuff, shocking and confounding, happening more and more. But no one left to right seems to have much to say on the subject. In the summer of 1966, Charles Whitman left a suicide note, climbed a tower at the University of Texas, and shot 14 people to death. In the ensuing years, the term going postal emerged, referring to a slowly rising incidence of workplace killings. But in the past 10 years, since, since Kip Kinkle at Thurston in 1998, that's the town next to ours in, in Oregon, suicidal multiple homicides, homicide rampages have become commonplace. Columbine 99 and a quickening recent string, for example, Cho at Virginia Tech last spring, the 19-year-old Omaha mall shooter in December, the honor student at Northern Illinois University last month, four school shootings in one week in February, in fact. The explanations are so weak as to be barely even voiced. It's about too many guns. I was brought up in the 1950s in a household containing many firearms. No one went to school to shoot other children. Guns have been everywhere in this culture but the shootings are a current deepening reality. It's due to the closure of mental health facilities. As if in the past such individuals would have been institutionalized, most of these individuals showed no psychotic symptoms at all. If everyone on antidepressants were suspect, millions would have to be on locked wards. No, there's a pathology abroad that is too much to contemplate within the dominant discourse. Too much is implicated. So many, many words about terrorism. All the terrorism, the threat of terror attacks, those Islamic suicide bombers. Hey, let's not forget those eco-terrorists. Of course, one is far more likely to be a victim of gunfire at a school, in a mall, at the workplace, than to be blown up in war on terror hostilities. The real terror increasingly is that of daily life in mass society. Meanwhile, many are consumed by the latest cycle of electoral nonsense and manipulation. Can you imagine any politician touching the shootings epidemic with a thousand foot pole? Denial still reigns, but is being stalked in a grisly way. The rot at the core of industrial life is now rotting all the way through. The decomposition is far advanced and exposed for all to see. What's happening in society is the flip side of the rapid destruction of the biosphere. There has been a very disturbing jump in the, the number of parents killing their own children. 
On February 18th, the Center for Disease Control reported that the suicide rate among middle-aged Americans has jumped 20% in the last five years. In recent months, a county in Wales has endured an, an explosion of teen suicides, and so it goes. Stress, depression, insomnia, anxiety on the rise. People with no hope are signing out and taking others with them. The crisis of meaning is not just a postmodern catchphrase. We find ourselves adapting and justifying as meaning, texture, community, freedom slip away from our lives. Isaac Asimov's Robots of Dawn describes a techno culture in which the face to face is all but vanished. Sound familiar? Welcome to the dead zone and it's no future, where only one of the delusions is that life in this industrialized techno culture could ever be green, sustainable, or healthy. Time to wake up and smell the gun smoke. Well, this is a topic that's happening. You know, again, it's uh, pretty much daily. What happens in the personal and, and social sphere? And uh, of course, it deserves attention, I would say. And the other side of the coin is what's happening with the, in terms of the unfolding uh, eco disaster. And you know, time and time again, not not for, for instance, this fellow Cho in Virginia, but you hear this over and over. It's, it's really one of the most frightening things in terms of the shootings. We could have never imagined that X would have done this. Never, never in a million years. For example, that honors student who was revered by his teachers, his girlfriend, everybody else, walks up to a lecture stage and, and uh, gun people down in February. Well, it's, you know, maybe there's a, Maybe there's a kind of a parallel, a similarity in terms of collapsing ecosystems and uh, extinction of species, or at least disappearance of species. You read that. Uh, I read religiously the science section every Tuesday in the New York Times, and more and more of that, various frog species and bats was last week, and you know, honeybees, et cetera. And, uh, and, and so often, the same kind of thing. How did that happen? Just poof, you know, where did they go? I mean, gee, we don't know. Uh, same kind of incredulity somehow, as if it's some kind of mystery. Of course, sometimes it's no mystery at all. It's you, you destroy habitat, that takes care of whatever it is, polar bears or, or whatever it might be, but, but there's also this kind of uh, mystery thing. And so, sometimes the two sides of the coin converge. For example, the uh, there have been, in this decade already, several studies, you might have, you might have heard of uh, some of them, about uh, urban water systems and uh, how much pharmaceuticals of different kinds there is in the water. Water treatment doesn't screen out the, the amount of drugs that uh, people take, for example, antidepressants. So you've got the uh, battering of, of inner nature causing more of the battering of outside nature, of, of outer nature, and, and, they're, and they come together in a, in a sad way. And, and this is only growing. You know, this is only, uh, this, this continues to go on. Uh, I mean, some of these things, though, are, are just terribly obvious. They're just terribly obvious. And the only thing that's lacking is the punchline. The only thing that's lacking is the, to me, fairly obvious conclusion, the, the consequences. For example, global warming the most commonplace part of the crisis, one might say, in terms of the physical environment. Well, this, this uh, as really, I guess, everybody knows, this unprecedented uh, cycle of global warning, and there have been others in the remote past, uh, this one started 200 years ago. Well, so did the Industrial Revolution. Got going about 200 years ago. And every step of industrialization is a step of global warming. It's, it's just an exact correspondence. So, uh, gee, then uh, you don't even have to, I mean, the conclusion is there. You don't even have to say industrialism is, is what, what it is. They're, they're synonymous. But, but not too many people yet have said, well, hmm, maybe this isn't working out too well, this whole industrial thing. Uh, and you know, we, we tend to, some of us deal uh, with 
social theory or political theory or we return to it, we try to get some help there, we try to see what's going on with that. And we've noticed, and, and the literature is growing a little bit here in terms of, for example, the promises of enlightenment. Uh, have, they haven't worked out too well, those claims just quite, they haven't uh, really uh, produced uh, what, they were, what they were supposed to be. And that's, that too is pretty much, uh, that was concurrent with the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And one of those claims, of course, is that science and technology will give us uh, a lovely world, will bring us out of superstition and so forth, and it'll be, it'll be humanistic and, and wise and, and so on. And then, so modernity arises at about this time, uh, to be uh, kind of general about it. Uh, modernity also very, very commonly referred to by the term civil society. Any, any theory along these lines, every other term is civil society. But I think it's, I think it's useful to come back to the point of, of the industrial world, which is, in this case, why not just call it what it is? Why not get down to the real stuff, which is, it is mass society. It's the society of mass production. It is industrial society. And, and the euphemistic uh, kind of abstract words don't help us too much. They just continue to feed us these promises that are so very tarnished, to say the least. Uh, and, and of course now, we're supposed to believe, it's hard to imagine that we, that it's a credible idea that we would, but we're, we're in the post-industrial period now. We don't have to worry about such things because uh, what's well, post everything, of course, these days, but uh, as, if, as if the technology comes down from heaven or something and, and uh, arrives immaculately or something and isn't, isn't the product of more and more industrialization. I mean, that's, that's, another, uh, that's another truism. There's nothing that could be uh, less, less mysterious about that. And, and we have, uh, which no one can miss, is China industrializing like wild and India right on its heels. And so we're getting more of this. We, well, we're getting more technology and, and that's where it comes from. And of course there, as, as I guess everyone knows, the rivers are being poisoned. Cities in the east you can barely see across the street. The Summer Olympics, everybody's gonna be wearing gas masks and thousands of miners die every year. There's blood on that process and on its fruits. Million ton plumes of pollution now reach Western North America because it's so massive. It's just so unbelievable. But, uh, and along these lines, I, uh, I recall, and I think this is pertinent here, a, uh, there was a forum on public television a few years ago. Uh, a little diversion, but a digression, but I don't think it's really a digression. Uh, and the part I remember is dealt with Henry Kissinger, you know, the Dr. Strangelove of the 70s, the evil uh, Nixonian guy back then. And uh, but he was being interrogated by, uh, by someone who wasn't really talking about, he could have talked about the millions of Asians killed by US policy, US military, but instead, this was a very detailed indictment of what the U.S. has done, what the results have been in terms of uh, ecological devastation in, in various parts of the world, specifically Asia, but not just Asia. And so this particular round, this, this guy is just giving it to him, he's, and he's got it very well uh, detailed. It's just chapter and verse. It's just going down the line and, and just giving him this withering blast, just, you know, you've got blood on your hands and, and he's just going on and on, not rhetorically, but he's giving the, uh, he's giving the detailed scholarly uh, account. And uh, I think like everybody else, I'm sitting there thinking, what on earth is this guy gonna say? There's no, you got, what, <laughs> there's no way to go. I mean, you, uh, I can't imagine what he would say to get out of this. I mean, he, there he was, just nailed, uh, one thought. Well, and then, so the guy finally finishes and Kissinger kind of turns to him as if he was almost dozing through the whole thing, was <laughs> hardly paying attention. And he says, so, uh, let me get this straight here. Uh, you want to have a credit card and a car and uh, a computer, maybe? 
but you don't think that anyone in uh, India or China should have the chance to have those things. Is that right? And, and boom, the guy was just flattened. He had nothing to say, absolutely nothing to say. Well, uh, that's the problem. That's the aporia, if you will, of this. That's the kind of dead end that you have. If you subscribe to all this stuff, then, then what are you left with? What, what is your answer? What is your alternative? Of course, if you don't want a world of, of cars and credit cards and, and, uh, and Walmarts and, and computerized life and all the rest of it, then you do have an answer. You don't want it. Not that you're, not that you're in any position to forbid other people, but when you hear every, everybody has a right to industrialization, they have a right to modernity, well, it sounds more like they have a right to suicide. You know, we've, we've got to catch up with the other countries well, you do within this system, but that's just another, it's just another way, maybe a, a very primary way of, of pointing out what's wrong with the system. And if you don't break with it, yeah, that's the course you do have to follow. I was in Turkey a couple of weeks ago and, and I heard this guy saying, we got a lot of catching up to do. And, and you look out and see it's already polluted and people are, are miserable in, in lots of ways. Anyway, that's, that's the point. Uh, on that one. Uh, I mean, in other words, that's one argument. You, you, you want it, but you don't want them to have it because you, you rather not to have their pollution blown over here. You forget your own history, you know, and uh, anyway. And there's another basic argument that maybe there are more than two, but the other one, I uh, actually heard it phrased this way in Turkey very recently uh, by someone who said, you can present this whole case, or whatever you want to call it, and the reply can come back, well, you might as well, or how was it, but uh, you can't stop the sun from rising. In other words, everything you say might be true. Uh, it doesn't matter, though. It's irrelevant, because the physical reality of, of industrialization and technology and so forth, it's an inevitable process. It's never gone backwards, never going to go backwards. So you can just yammer all you want, but uh, that's 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 it. In other words, you don't even you don't even bother with the argument. Neither did Kissinger, of course. He, he just you just changed the subject to well, what were what are you going to do about it, or what what is anybody going to do about it? It's more like that. Well, so okay, there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, and why would this be true? Well, it's true because so far it hasn't been problematized. It's been treated as an inevitability. It's been treated as this is all neutral. It's strictly a neutral deal. It's just these discrete things that have nothing to do with politics or values or anything. It's, it's all in how it's used. That's the whole ball game. But when you look around, especially now, I think you can see, you can doubt that proposition uh, pretty clearly, it seems to me. And I've got two examples here. Uh, and they both, they both just, they just get to me every time I think of them. And one was just a photo, a wire photo uh, in a newspaper a few years ago from Japan, from a Japanese nursing home, picture of uh, an elderly uh, woman in a contraption, <clears throat> a contraption looked like a coffin, kind of a metal coffin. And there's a window, or an opening by her face, but it looked like a coffin. Some reading, what, what, is, what is she doing in there? Well, it's a washing machine. We just push the button, no human touch. She's not bathed by another human being. It's just, it's a washing machine. And that's, and that's how you treat people. That's, that's the technology that's value free, I guess. Another one more recent, a year ago in Utney Magazine, uh, used to be Utney Reader, I think it's just called Utney now. And this, this, I can't even believe that this was not a parody, but it wasn't. It was about uh, virtual bereavement. In other words, when somebody, for example, somebody you know, maybe they lost their spouse or their child or their mother or something like that, you don't, it's, it's much better, don't go there. You know, don't, don't try to be present for them, maybe, maybe hug them or you know, try, to, try to offer something. No, it's, it's much better to do it online. Online grieving, you just, you know, that's, that's way better. It's more convenient, you know, you're not intruding. That's, that's the technology, again, with no values. It's, <laughs> it's so ghastly that, how could you make that up? How could you make either of those two things up and, and, and keep pretending that it's, uh, that it's neutral, that values aren't embedded in that technology? And in fact, I, I think that 
it's always been so. It has always been so. Back to simple tools, and I think for me, my, my way of looking at this is there's a big distinction between tools, uh, especially ones that, are, that don't involve much division of labor, and systems of technology. In other words, when, when I use the word technology, I'm not talking about tools. But for example, simple, like simple stone tools to go way back, I think what, they, what the values there are are things like autonomy, equality, flexibility, intimacy, things like that. Anybody could make them, either gender could make them, you're not reliant on somebody else. Whereas te technological systems, to generalize grandly here, the values there are coldness, distancing, standardization, uh, dependence on experts, a more and more total dependence on experts as, we, as the days go by. So these are choices, these are values, this is political, even if uh, it isn't seen that way, or not yet seen that, that way. And we are incessantly told that we have to accept the accelerating uh, direction or imperative of, of all this, of this whole technological thing. And we hear these claims, and very briefly, I think three of the key ones, which are visibly lies, I would say, uh, you hear them all the time, television commercials and so on. Uh, technology empowers us. And, but it's strange that the more and more technological society becomes, the more and more disempowered people are. Another one is all the variety and the richness and, and the heterogene heterogeneous uh, excess and so forth. But as Frederick Jameson said, we live in the most standardized society that has ever existed. So there's, there's a little loose fit there, you might say. And the other one is isolation. And this is probably the one, or I'm connectedness, the claim of connectedness. We're all connected now. We're as wired as we can be, and we're just all connected. And that's probably the, most, that's probably the one you hear the most. You can't get away from that one. But uh, it's funny that in the real world, single person households just keep on booming upwards and there was a very striking study, I thought, in, uh, this is about a year and a half ago, in the American Journal of Sociology. It was a 19-year-old, it, it was a study comparing friends, the number of uh, friends that uh, adult Americans have from the mid-80s to uh, 2005, 19-year uh, time frame there. And they found that the number of friends was three, meaning, uh, by the way, uh, some of you confide in, That's, that was their basic definition of a friend. Not, not a MySpace friend that you, know, that you never met or something like that, but, uh, but 19 years later it was down to two. 50% fewer friends in 19 years. And the number of people with no friends had tripled. So what is this connectedness? How, how we're all together and everything, but uh, only, according to the machine, only according to their definition, is that valid, I, I would say. So that's, you know, this is powered by, uh, as I kind of briefly maybe alluded to, in terms of the difference between tools and technologies, by specialization, by division of labor, that's a common place. It has driven the systems, and it drives the modern world system, the modern economies, just like it did in the beginning, ask any economist. That's that's just well known. There's no, there's nothing tricky about that one. But the other one uh, I want to refer to very briefly is domestication, or domination of nature, and that that is uh, something that has proceeded apace as well. And that's the shift to control. That's the shift away from taking what nature supplied to to the, the, the move to, to extort from nature, to colonize nature, to uh, engineer nature, to make, to make nature work. What, uh, what Jared Diamond called the uh, worst mistake in human history. Uh, and it starts with domestication of animals and plants. It starts with agriculture. And then it moves, as we know, it, it goes to cloning, genetic engineering, nanotechnology, where the control is now down to the atomic level, the, the, the invasiveness, the, the level of control. It's that same logic. 
Paul Shepard said that the first step to agriculture contains the other stuff, the, it's implicit. You will get to the genetic engineering and the total control sooner or later if you don't break that logic, if you don't do something about that. He, he saw it as an inner logic. And uh, it's, I think it's kind of hard to, kind of hard to dispute that. And now we see uh, a little more clearly, it's easier to see, I think, the, the validity of, of that. Uh, I don't want to go on and on. I, I'd, I'd like to, oh, well, here's another thing that's kind of a favorite of mine in terms of the domestication thing. And that's good old Sigmund Freud, the civilization and its discontents. And he predicted that the more domestication, the more civilization there is, the more neurosis there is. Because uh, uh, that's, I'm just isolating this part of, of Freud. There's obviously a lot more that isn't pertinent to this. But he said that it's a wound that doesn't heal. When you break human beings like you break a horse, they, it, you, that is psychically uh, an injury that, that will just continue. The, the state of domestication is not a happy world. Of course, he, as a good bourgeois, he said, but you don't get people working and you don't get symbolic culture, you don't get art and so forth, unless and until you domesticate people. So he felt it's a terrible price to pay, but oh, okay, I guess, but at least he was honest enough to show this is the toll. This is the price that does have to be paid. And that was in 1930, I think it was. And uh, I think that's uh, ever more clear what he was saying, that uh, that's, uh, it, is, it is a painful thing. So we, you know, it, it's just, how do, we, how do we stop things from just getting worse? And uh, I don't want to stand around with the, the end is near sign, but I mean, things are getting worse in, in some really frightening ways. Frightening in a personal way to me. I have two grandkids and I just really, you just think what's going to be the case here in even five years. It, it's, and a lot of people feel that things could just crash. That this whole thing could fail for a number of reasons. And if you ask people that just a few years ago, I think they'd kind of look at you like, what are you talking about? Now, it's amazing to me how many more people, and I have no polling results or study uh, uh, figures or anything like that, but I, I've asked, this, I've kicked this around, I've asked people what they think about the response, and it's, and I, I'm always hearing, it's not a question of, of uh, if, it's a question of when. So we're, we're going over that cliff, and, and, but we keep on hearing, gee, we can't go back now. We have to just keep on industrializing and keep on with the mass world, mass consumption, mass culture. It's all been so satisfying. It, it's, it has something to do with these shootings. It, you can't make a world that desolate, empty out all the texture and so forth, and then, and then be so puzzled as to why you have these awful, uh, awful results. I mean, it, it's very hard to take in. I think it's just very hard to take in, but, but there's some kind of hard questioning that we got to undertake here. Um, let me just conclude with one other little uh, story which kind of sadly summed up some of this to me. You may be, some, some of you may be uh, familiar with the work of Sherry Turkle. She's at MIT. She's not only a uh, pretty expert in, in uh, high-tech developments, but also she's a psychologist. And uh, she's written several books about the impact, the, the amount of uh, anxiety and, and so forth, uh, the, the amount of alienated uh, uh, impacts that the, that the the faster and faster wired world has on people, especially the youth. And she referred in her talk to her 14-year-old daughter. It was a very moving, eloquent talk. And she, she even said that in some important ways, her daughter doesn't know the difference between something that's animate, something that's living, and something that isn't. And it, I mean, that was, uh, that's her daughter she's talking about in, in terms of the reality of this. This was at the University of Oregon last fall. And then she said at the very end, she said, uh, oh, well, that's the price you got to pay. Got to have technology. Got to have the modern stuff. And I was just floored. I, mean, I, just, I just couldn't, I couldn't get that. I mean, 
And I think a lot of people there, too. Now it's a little more, maybe you could get away with that a few years ago, but that's just, that doesn't, that just doesn't add up ethically or intellectually or any other way. That's, that's, that can't be true. You know, otherwise you're just saying, oh, well, uh, just, wow, let's just uh, sit back and, and uh, agonize or something, but, but always remember, but we got to do it. You know, there's just no two ways about it. It's just inevitable. And that was really, uh, anyway, I'll just leave it at that. And maybe we can uh, have some discussion if you want. I think uh, he was asking whether or not a lot of this isn't just U.S. specific. And uh, in the case of Denmark shows, uh, shows a nicer reality. Uh, well, I, I totally agree. There's, there's, it's much better in, in uh, various Scandinavian countries, I think, although they do have some problems with suicide and, and, uh, and alcoholism in, in some of those places. I'm not an expert on that. But I actually, I was in Turkey with the Danish uh, couple uh, just recently, the, the trip I just referred to, and uh, I learned a little about it. But I think uh, you, you can see, but in a, in a certain way, maybe they get a free ride because they don't have to have the factories necessarily in Denmark, but somebody does. And so I'm afraid that what is happening, when you look at the most developed countries, the most technologically advanced countries like the US and Japan, you do see pretty scary pathological things. And I don't want to get into a thing about Japan, but maybe you know some of those things. They're, they're pretty, they're, they're become science fiction things all, like a million people, just to mention one thing, hikikomori it's called, where there's a million people, young people, who don't leave their rooms. They just don't, they don't come out for like maybe decades, or you know, it's, there's some very severe problems. And these, but these are the ones, and what I think is going to happen, and I hate to say this, but it's going to spread to all these other countries. It just, unless they manage to be an island, but they, they probably won't be an island for long. I mean, you mentioned gun control, and that's, I mean, it, I, that's quite so. I mean, the, this culture is, is crazy with guns. So, but... And that, so there are exceptions. I don't want to just make it sound like it's just a uniform deal all over the world, because I agree with you, it's not. But I, I don't know why this would not be spreading as you get more and more high tech and, and more, of, more of what I, I think, as many people have written about in di different ways, so much is being drained away and just replaced by, by all these mediations and separations, which is the high tech, uh, the technoculture. And, uh, you know, but again, I agree with you. I mean, it's, it sounds much nicer in Denmark. They, they, don't have, uh, they don't have these same situations, but uh, yet they're part of the same world. And the acid rain and everything falls on them too, whether it comes from China or Germany or whatever. It's, it's, uh, I'm not saying nothing is happening. I mean, you know, there are, there are some reforms, there are some partial solutions, but you know, the, the, pro the solution here, and I think elsewhere, is, oh yes, we have this crisis, we have the global warming, blah, blah, but technology is the answer. And it's always more technology. Never wanting people to notice it's technology to just use that catchword, it creates a problem in the first place. So you want more technology. That's insane. That's it, not, we, even if we all want to be in denial and want to believe that's true, that somehow this will be averted by some some thing that's, uh, there's, uh, there's no real basis for that, in my opinion, at all. And the people that are, by the way, are looking for the green, sustainable energy sources to replace oil, which is rapidly running out, well, you know, you could say to that, but there's a lot of stuff that should have never been done in the first place. And you just want to find new means to fuel the same thing. I mean, Bush wants that. That's, that's, doesn't, that doesn't tackle the real, the qualitative things that are happening. What, what flows from domestication specifically? Why, why should it be just domestication? Well, I think uh, my best guess on that is that it does follow. In other words, the division of labor, the, the specialization was a very, very slow process before, uh, up, until, up into the upper Paleolithic, before domestication, in other words. But you were starting to have some 
uh, aspects of hierarchy and, and uh, some negative estrangements or alienation, some tensions. And I think that it's, it probably makes sense to see that as setting the stage for domestication. That, it couldn't have, it probably wouldn't have started without that, which is already an erosion of, of a previous state, which, you know, plus and minus, it didn't, it wasn't doing that. It wasn't going in that direction. And so then, but then domestication was, a, you know, a relatively sudden jump off in lots of parts of the world at the same time and all that. And I think what connects that is the control aspect. The, the, the heart of it is control. How do we control the earth? And, uh, but, but I think the two are connected. In fact, uh, I think the div division of labor divides the self, you could say, it divides it into roles, into specific production roles, slowly. But, but back in ancient civilizations, too, they had these big workshops, you know, almost factory-like pottery, baking, and so forth. There was some of that already, but that, that divided self almost immediately creates divided society or class society. So the arguments, some of the arguments we have with Marxists, for example, is we're not, we, we are interested in that problem of class society, divided society, but we think the roots of it are, are much deeper than, quote, capitalism. I mean, capitalism is part of the problem for sure, but what is, what is, what, what drives it in a more primary sense before that? You know, what, what is creating already the basis for, for, for the rest of it? How, how to reverse domestication? Right. Well, that's to, first of all, pose it as a problem, as, a, as something to be overcome. And I think some people are doing it. One of the, one of the key things, of course, is food. How are we going to eat without, without uh, these different things? And that's why some people are exploring permaculture with that in mind, or, or the, uh, the methods of Fukuoka, the, the uh, One Straw Revolution uh, guy, and I think he's still alive. Or, or, and some people put more emphasis on what did indigenous people eat? They, they weren't cultivating. Of course, there's a lot more people now. That's, that's another problem. That's another situation. But, you know, in other words, if you see it as a problem, then, then you can start addressing it. In other words, I don't think it's foreordained that we're, we're just locked in. We're locked in as long as we say it's neutral, for example, and just go, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. It's like the sun coming up. There's... Well, that's a huge one, overpopulation. Uh, well, it's, I don't know, that's, that's just a really tough one. It's, but I think that kind of imbalance is, is, not a natural, is not a natural occurrence. And the anthropologists seem to tell us that the, that the population thing started going up with domestication. So maybe if, you, if we were pulling the plug on domestication, maybe some of those uh, maybe some of the drive that, that creates the overpopulation will, will recede as well. In other words, if it's an effect, uh, a symptom more than a cause in itself, then what is causing, what is causing the symptom? And, and domestication may be, uh, may be a big part of that. So that's, that's kind of, you know, I don't know, that's a little who knows. But it is true that it didn't go up until... With, with, because it used to be said mainly that uh, there was so much population that, that you, know, you had to have the means of production to feed everybody, so there was agriculture. But it's really more that the other, it's the other way around. That's when the population started up, when you got domestication, not, not so much the other way around. Not that there weren't some population pressures in some places, but that seems to be the consensus I've read. Well, I, I, uh, what would be the solution? What would be the practical part of it uh, if, if there was some, uh, if there was some uh, way of, of uh, tackling this, what would it be? Well, I mentioned very briefly in passing the food thing that there are practical experiments going on with, with uh, uh, non-domesticated uh, food, you know, that, that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, the, that, I don't know if this is, I don't know if I have a very great answer for this one, to tell you the truth, that's for sure. But, but, uh, but one thing that strikes me, there are people, there are a lot of people, Noam Chomsky for one, is, is very fond of saying, this perspective just means a massive die-off. 
these people want, consciously or unconsciously, they want billions of people to die, and that's the whole deal. But, but he knows full well that nobody, nobody I know anyway, is talking about a sudden overnight shift, like you could pull the plug and, of course, we couldn't if we wanted to, but we don't want to. I mean, uh, you, you go to places like, uh, like it was just in Istanbul and Sao Paulo before, and it, it's just staggering. You, if this thing did crash, how many people would be dead in two days? I mean, there, there's 20 million people in, in Sao Paulo. They don't, there's no prayer for them. They don't know how to, they, don't, they wouldn't know what to do at, at this moment if, if they fled the cities, if, if all the power stopped and everything else. It would be just horrendous. Those are the, in other words, the people who want the die off are the ones who don't want to face up to what's going on. We're talking about some kind of process or some kind of transition, not, not to just suddenly apocalyptically, uh, it's so evil, we're just gonna cut it off right now. No, that's, that, would be un, that would be unthinkable. It's, it's, it would have to involve all kinds of things to tackle our dependence, and all of us, including me, are very dependent on all this stuff. You know, every, every part of it. And, but once it's problematized, then, and also when, by the way, I think, if and when people begin to think that this isn't paying off, then people will be engaged in the solution. You know, how do you start moving away from it instead of continuing to go over the cliff or, or advancing to the cliff? There was, there was a guy I know who, who said, who chided us. He said, you will never make the revolution by promising people less. And we don't use the word revolution much uh, at all, but, but he made a good point. What do you have to offer? The, uh, nothing? I mean, <laughs> kind of like what you said, but, but at a certain point, it seems to me, less is more. More of, of taking uh, all kinds of anti-anxiety, antidepressant drugs, and having your kids start on them when they're 18 months old, and, and all this unthinkable stuff. And, and you can see the collapse of the ecosystems is well underway. What, what part of that is more? We want more, and, but that's what the left says. More, this and more. That's the program, this and more. Well, that's, that's just catastrophic, it seems to me. But, but the question about what do you actually do only becomes real if, if people uh, want to go there. And then I think it's not so, I mean, how do people live? I mean, you, you know, you talk to kids, and I'm not going to try to slam kids, but there are a lot of people who think there was no life before cell phones or before uh, all this stuff, and I'm thinking, gee, there was something that happened in the 60s, wasn't there? And people didn't, uh, didn't even have uh, the internet, you know? I mean, let's, come on, you, this stuff is, uh, and how many calls can you make in 30 minutes to, to say nothing? I mean, what, what is the point of that? What, what's going on with that? I mean, that's ridiculous. And cell phones are the most toxic thing, ounce for ounce, probably in the world. And they go into the, into the earth thousands of, thousands of them a day. I mean, it's all crazy. So, I, I mean, I don't have a bill of uh, a blueprint or, or a list of we do X, Y, and Z, but there's, there's got to be a reverse of this thing. There's got to be different ways. That's because everything is, is disappearing. Community, a word that's used all the time, especially in America. Every politician and a lot of other people, community, community. Well, what happened to it? Where is it? Show me the community. Why did it disappear? And what would it take to restore it? You know, how can we relocalize that sort of thing, decentralize? That's, that's what we're talking about. Globalization is another, there's, there's a somewhat practical issue, if you will. The, the people that, the, the anti-globalization movement that was big a few years ago, well, it, it was never anti-globalization. You can be anti-globalization. You can be literally anti-globalization. But you know, during all the big protests, and I was there for some of them, I'm not, I'm not uh, trashing it, but you know, the reporter would always come up to the, to the nearest protester and, and say, so why are you against globalization? And they'd always say, we're not against globalization. But we want the nice kind. We want the bottom-up kind, or the, or the this or that kind, the warm and fuzzy kind. Well, I mean, to us, you want it or you don't want it. You, you, you want the global world, the, the, the grid, the, the, the totalizing, standardizing, homogenizing thing, you, or not. And they, they never answered that question, and the movement went away. And I think that's one reason why it did go away. They didn't have a serious answer to that, to that thing. So, in other words, what, what are we talking about? What, what, uh, if you don't want X, then what do you want? And, and 
we can spell it out how you get there, though your question raises, it's not going to be too easy. We're all so sucked in, in every single way. I, I was in London uh, a few years ago, and, uh, and this kind of back is jumping up and down saying, did you swim over here? Did you swim over here? And no, you're right. I'm a hypocrite. I'm caught in every contradiction like anybody else. And no, it was a big polluting jet. I didn't swim. I'm not much of a swimmer. And OK, you know, you got me. But you know, we didn't ask to be born into this, but now we've got to deal with it. I'm actually pretty optimistic. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty hopeful. I don't think this is going to last much longer. I think I really don't. I think the system has no answers. It really doesn't. It has no future. Uh, overconsumption is maybe the, the chief uh, uh, problem. To, well, but you know, when, when the world goes in a certain direction, overconsumption, we might call it, is about all that's left. I mean, that's why it's not to be so totally deterministic about it, but how do you stop the overconsumption? I mean, that's where freedom is, really. You can choose brand X or brand Y or brand Z, but you don't choose much else because you've been cut off from, from the land. And, you know, I, and I know there's a lot of different, uh, there are various views on this, for sure. I, I've, uh, I know people in, in, uh, in other countries that are not developed who very much would agree with me or I would agree with them. And certainly some don't. They, they want to develop. They want to, they want to modernize. You know? so, but uh, but uh, that's, that's a question of what is the standard of living? What is the quality of life? I mean, this is, this is a cultural question. You know? if, if it's to have a Walmart all over or whatever, have a chain store, or you know, to, I'm just exaggerating, but is that a better standard of living than indigenous people who actually have a connection to the earth and, and, and a, an in integrity of their culture and their traditions, then their their uh, their wisdom, replace it with the factory. I don't know if that's a better standard of living. I mean, that's not for me to say, but look, but you can see the trajectory. And uh, you know, and you know, the U.S. government is very fond of the propaganda that uh, people come here because they all want credit cards and they they all want to be happy consumers. Well, everybody knows. If you drive people off the land, and that's been happening since the beginning of civilization, yeah, they're driven into the cities. It's not exactly necessarily a great free choice that they can't wait to get away from, from their own lands, from their own uh, you know, realities, their, their own everything. You know, that's, that's some propaganda. And I'm, I'm certainly not saying you're saying that, but we hear that too. You know? the, the, uh, I think the main question is, what would be examples of, of uh, a viable uh, uh, something like uh, what we're talking about currently or in the past? Well, sometimes we're fond of referring to the Paleolithic as the original anarchy, where it was banned society, where, where society was like maybe 60 people or something like that, and uh, pre-political, of course, way before the state, uh, obviously, where people took responsibility for each other uh, and there was community. Maybe that's that was the community, the the original community. Uh, well, it was the original community. Uh, foraging society, hunter gatherer society, band society, it all means the same thing. Uh, well, where I guess we get our main uh, inspiration is uh, is trying to learn from indigenous practices and some Native Americans now here and now, who. Uh, who are and 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 there are certainly various uh, folks there who not and they're not all political by any means. You know, trying to reconnect with their traditions and teach the young uh, these things that are uh, being kind of uh, get, getting rid of these things. Uh, and some some of these folks call us neo primitivists. That because, you know, which it seems like a fitting word, I guess. But. Uh, I don't think there's much left in the current world. You know, this is all, it's made to disappear. You know, it's, it's, it's in the way. That's one of the other losses, you know, along with the biological diversity and, and so many other things. Uh, indigenous cultures, got to go. And that's, and that's one of the, by the way, I, I, 
some people are very excited about uh, leftist developments in South America, but I think one of the problems, one of the, one of the fears that you can have about that is that the left is doing a better job of industrializing than, than the neocons and the neoliberal folks down there who had their chance. And what really has to happen, and so many people have admitted this, you've got to, get, you've got to break the resistance of these indigenous cultures. And they are trying their best to co-opt these. They're trying to turn them into consumers and citizens. They're, they're not valid as Indians. And that's, uh, that's not where we're at. That's one of the reasons we're not leftist. So there's, you know, this is a big, uh, the mega machine as Lewis Mumford called it, it's, it's, it rolls on and it doesn't take any prisoners. In fact, that's what the technology thing now for a little while has been. The, you know, the major propaganda for the system in a, ge in a general sense used to be when, like when I was a kid, the American dream, it's going to be a greater future and, or even Reagan, you know, the bright, what it was, the, the, the morning in America kind of nonsense, the way they all still say that, I guess. But uh, uh, now it's more, this is it. Get on board or you're a loser. You're, you're left behind. You won't have a paddle. I mean, that's really, the ads, you can find these ads, you know, they, they pretty much just say that. We're not promising nothing. We're threatening you, and, you know. And the people who say you got a choice, that's another part of that. I remember uh, back in the early 80s when the PC revolution started, you know, the whole PC explosion. Uh, the, uh, oh, oh, people would say, well, you don't like it, don't go there. Don't get a computer, don't, don't. Uh, but of course that's, that's uh, that's meaningless because you can't go to school without being wired. And now they're, they're dropping writing classes. No one needs to write because it's all this. I mean, it's, you, you can, it's, it's absurd to say you have a choice. It, there's no choice. It's a total thing. Pretty much. I mean, I'm not saying, you know, absolutely. You know, we can still think and, and so forth, but it's not some accident that these things all work together and, and are producing these results. He's, he's asking, is it, is it a serious proposition that life would be better as a hunter-gatherer than the modern life, right? Something like that, right? Well, you know, some of this is stereotypes. I mean, and if you, you can reach each other, and I have friends in different parts of the world I don't get to see unless I, you know, get on the internet, but uh, that's a compensation for you know, a world where you don't know your neighbor. I mean, where there used to be a, a real embodied connectedness and now there isn't. I mean, I, I mean, the, the maybe, you know, if it's a kind of ultimate goal of, uh, of a world that doesn't uh, extort from, from the earth or from each other, that's, uh, it is kind of distant and vague. I mean, again, no way that could happen overnight, but that's a better direction, it strikes me. And you started mentioning uh, medicine. That's not that. That's probably the strongest one, in in some ways anyway, the strongest case for for modernity. But it's starting to fail there too. You know, what about AIDS? What about I mean, there's all these things now. There's this the uh, amount of uh, resistance to these antibiotics is really getting scary. You know, the E. coli and uh, all these other things. And TB is coming back. You mentioned TB. They, it's really industrial medicine. Even that is, and that's got a somewhat good record. You know, people do live longer. You know, no doubt about that. But then, but then they're taking ten drugs to stay alive, and it's going in the water. Says the, like I mentioned in the beginning. And you know, what is the quality of life? I mean, some people would rather have uh, a more vivid life, even if there's some dangers there, a, a direct, unmediated life, than than living in a kind of, uh, you know, sort of isolated, you know, haze for, for 90 years or something, you know, maybe. You know, in other words, it's, uh, these, these promises haven't been all that great. I mean, is it really better to trade reality for virtual reality for, you know, all these, is it really satisfying? Is it making people happy? Then why, why is everybody so anxious and depressed? And why, why are we having these these daily shootings, that's just so incredible. But there it is, it's, it's not gonna go away. It's gonna get worse.
That's a kind of modern uh, trope in a way. The, we, we always want to improve things. We always, technology advances because we're creative, you know, that whole thing. Actually, what, what has always baffled the archeologists is why did, why did lithic technology, why did stone tools say almost exactly the same for a million years? I mean, that's, that's a far case, I realize, but, but they are not disputing the fact that they probably had the same intelligence we do. And they were cooking with fire two million years ago and you know, traveling on the open seas and so forth and so on. I mean, it wasn't because they were too stupid to do it. Maybe it was because they had a good, viable, uh, stable system, and they didn't see the need to change it. But it, in modern, in, in, under civilization, you can say people always want to change things, but is that an autonomous choice, or is that the system talking in some ways? In other words, it didn't used to be that way, so why is it now? I mean, it's kind of like, just one more, I'm sorry I'm diverging here a little bit, you know, the question of human nature, it seems like similar. Isn't it human nature to want to, as you say, improve things, develop new stuff, you know, do go to the moon or whatever? Well, it wasn't human nature for two or three million years. Why is it, why is it in the last 9,000 years it's human nature to, to ruin everything and to make ourselves so unhappy?